I think we've all experienced it at some point in time in life, a moment when scarcity makes us more appreciative of what's around us. Um, in fact, that's been one of the, the privileges that I've experienced over the years, leading missions trips with students and sometimes with adults that, that's been valuable is, is that in the midst of experiencing or being around genuine poverty, the, the uh, experience of that has a tendency to open up our hearts and our eyes to the surplus that we, that we live in. Um, and, and oftentimes, one of the, the takeaways that students will have in those moments as they reflect on, on being in a culture very different than their own is the joy and contentment that they see in people who are living with so much less than them. And that's a good thing. A couple years ago, my oldest daughter was on our student trip to Milwaukee. Um, and as a part of that, experience, really the Milwaukee trip for our, in our student trips really is kind of foundational. It, it establishes sort of um, some, some parameters and framework, I guess you'd say, for what they will experience and be engaged in as they move through student ministry in these trips. And, um, and they were doing this 40-hour poverty simulation. Um, this is a part of every Milwaukee trip that we do. And, and it's meant to allow them, at least in part, to experience a time of living in poverty, what the challenges of that are, and, and how life is different than their own, and it changes their hearts. And as a part of this experience, um, uh, in the middle of the day, they're in this group of students, and they've got a leader with them, and they're responsible to find their own lunch for the day. And they've been given some resources, and so they went out to one location, and by the time they got there, it was closed. So somebody gave them some advice and said, well, why don't you try over here? We think there's some some food available over here. And so they went that direction. By the time they got there, that place has shut down as well. And so they're experiencing some genuine hunger in the midst of this, probably more so than oftentimes they experienced uh, in their life. And Jonathan, who was their youth pastor at the time, said, guys, let's just, we got to circle up and pray here. And I even, I remember him, he texted me a picture of the students just on the street corner praying and and just asking God to be their provision, to meet their need. And, and, and literally, they turn the corner on the block, and there's some um, uh, sacks of bread there, like manna from heaven, more or less. And, and somebody actually explains, like, hey, this is leftover from, from this or that, and you guys are welcome to it. And my daughter said that was the best meal I've ever eaten. Like just this loaf of bread, which we would take for granted all the time in our lives, she in that moment, because she was aware of her need, it changed the perspective that she had on this simple thing that she now gained that was so important and so delicious to her. It's amazing really how an awareness of a need changes our perspective. Today we're, we're going to continue in our series entitled With Jesus. What does it look like for you and I to live as an apprentice of Jesus 2,000 years later? What, what are the implications of that in our lives? Um, right now, we have been looking at a, a series of encounters that Jesus has with various individuals, and specifically encounters that take place around a table, around a shared meal. And last week, if you were here, we talked about the significance of, of eating with someone in this culture, how that communicated value and acceptance, and it communicated a sense of peace in the relationship to sit down over a table with someone. And it's also one of the primary reasons that, that the religious elites of the day were so frustrated with Jesus. Because he could be found sitting across the table with people who were considered undesirable or unworthy. That, that, that this isn't the sort of people that, that Jesus, a rabbi, a religious leader, should be spending his time with. And so at, at times, people would confront Jesus on this. They say, look, you're, you're eating with tax collectors and prostitutes and, and these notorious Sinners, And when Jesus is pressed on this, he says things like this. This is from the Gospel of Matthew when he's called Matthew to be his disciple, who is a tax collector. And Matthew throws a party. People gather at his house. Jesus is questioned about it. 
And Jesus says it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, quoting Hosea here. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What we saw last week when Jesus sits down with Zacchaeus and similarly people are upset and annoyed and disrupted by all of this, Jesus says to them, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Today we're going to look at at yet another encounter that Jesus has around the table with a shared meal. And what we'll discover here is that this is an encounter of contrast. It's an encounter of contrast. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. We've been in Luke the last three weeks together, three or four weeks. And we're going to look at another passage here where Jesus um, shares a meal. And this time it's a little bit different. It starts in the home of a Pharisee. This is Luke chapter 7 verse 36. He says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him in saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, He would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. As I said, this, this, this encounter here is really it's an encounter of contrast. And I want to look at at three things today. I want to begin by looking at the contrast of characters, the contrast of characters. We've all been in situations in life where people from very different walks of life get put in kind of the same parameters, right? And and we always kind of see something like that, and we wonder, well, I wonder how this is going to go. I wonder how this is going to work itself out. I had a friend years ago um, who knew that I was an enormous Ohio State fan. And so they thought it would be funny to invite me over to watch the Ohio State game, but also, unbeknownst to me, invited a friend of theirs who's a huge Michigan fan. All for the purpose, for their entertainment, of watching the two of us coexist in the same place and the same time during the Ohio State-Michigan game. You know, so it's like you're trying to act all respectful and Christian and all this stuff, and every time something bad happens, I'm trying to, like, manage it well, and every time something good happens, I'm trying not to be, like, a jerk in my my celebration, And, and the person who set all this up, they're not even watching the game. They're watching the scene unfold if the two of us are gonna kill each other or, like, what's gonna happen in this moment. See, what, what we have on display here really isn't one encounter with Jesus. It's two. And they happen simultaneously, and these are two people from very different walks of life. See, first we have Simon, who is, de- is described as a Pharisee, and, and he's an expert of the law. He is extremely religious and careful about maintaining all of the Old Testament rules and regulations. He is likely, as a result, wealthy because he's a part of the ruling class in that town. So there's a certain degree of 
power and authority that, that Simon carries among the people. And all of this is, is evident in Simon. But what is, I think, a little bit unclear in the text, and that I'm curious about, is what, what is motivating this? What is motivating this encounter with Jesus for Simon's perspective? Because on the one hand, perhaps Simon is curious. Perhaps Simon has heard about Jesus, about his teaching. Perhaps he wants to know more. Perhaps Simon is like Nicodemus in John chapter 3 who wants to go to him and, and ask him questions and see if perhaps this really is the Messiah. Nicodemus does that in the cover of night, right? He, he does that sort of covertly. Um, Simon is a bit more bold in his curiosity if that's what's motivating him. He publicly has Jesus over for dinner. Perhaps Simon is a skeptic. Perhaps he sees this as an opportunity to expose Jesus. In general, throughout the New Testament, Jesus is not exactly seen as a friend of the Pharisees. In, in no uncertain words, Jesus at times has spoken about their abuse of power. He's called them out on their lack of faith. He's rebuked them for the fact that being the spiritual leaders of Israel, they have failed to recognize and acknowledge the arrival of the Messiah. So in, in turn, the Pharisees aren't in general big fans of Jesus. In fact, in most instances, when we see the Pharisees paying specific attention to Jesus and interacting with him, they're doing so in an effort to sort of get, get something on him, to gather evidence, to be able to, to prove to the people that all this, this excitement and clamoring and their enthusiasm about his teaching, that it's all somehow a, a fraud and to expose Jesus. Perhaps Simon is just simply motivated out of obligation. Perhaps as a, a religious leader in that town, when a traveling rabbi is coming in, he feels it is just his sense of, of duty to be able to invite him into his home and to serve as a host. Perhaps Simon is just doing this out of, of obligation. But whatever his motivation is, what, why ever he's put himself at the table with Jesus, what is clear is that he stands in complete contrast to the uninvited guest who shows up. It says here in this text that the woman who, who shows up on the scene is identified simply as a woman in the town who lived a sinful life. Like how would you like that to be um, the moniker by which you are known? How would you like to be that? How would you like to be identified simply by your sin? But this is, this is how this woman is identified in the text. This reference, along with the alabaster jar that, that she carries with her, is an indication that she most likely has lived as a prostitute. Um, that that has been her life. So, so she has no acclaim. She, she has no position in her society. She has no credential to be able to bring to Jesus and that social structure, her and Simon are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Simon has his Pharisaical friends and his 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 power and his authority, and she's not even here um, by an invitation. She burst onto the scene unwelcome and and unannounced into Simon's home. So there's a. Pharisee with all his status and his power and his religious clout. And then we have this woman who, who has none of that. And they're both simultaneously interacting with Jesus. And it's the contrast of these two people that gives way to the contrast of response. The contrast of their response. Um, I, you know, sometimes in... in society, we live with certain rules that we kind of govern our actions by. There's certain things that are appropriate, right? We, we place ourselves, and in, in church, of course, is one of those places. We, we feel like, okay, there's appropriate attire, or there's appropriate ways to act, or talk, or all these sorts of things, and we do this in, in our society in a lot of, of different ways. Um, and one, one time when I was a um, a young youth pastor, one of the other pastors at the church I was working at, he and I would kind of run this like basketball 
um, night at church, and we would bring people in just to play basketball with them, and and um, my friend was always inviting people, always just getting people there, and so we'd gather together and play, and some of these guys would not necessarily recognize that they're playing basketball in a church, um, and so it was it was not uncommon that, that they would use language, perhaps, that we would typically not think of to be appropriate. Like, like we use the Christian version of that word when we miss a shot or whatever, you know? And they're just, they're letting it fly. And I'm kind of like starting to get nervous. Like, look around, like, please don't let a deacon be walking by right now or, or whatever. And, and George, my friend, who just has this amazing heart for outreach, he's actually a missionary in Africa now, but um, he's like, isn't it great? He's like, you know, you just, he's like, it's music to my ears to know there's people here that, that they're not in a relationship with Jesus yet. They don't even know they're not supposed to talk this way here. Like, isn't this fantastic? And I was like, yeah, George, but we're going to get fired. Like, th- this is great. And see, this, this scene that's unfolding, we have to take a moment to acknowledge the awkwardness of what is happening here. Look again at verse 37 and 38. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at a Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. Like, things got weird at this dinner quickly, right? I mean, this woman comes in and she throws herself at Jesus' feet. She is wiping his feet with her with her, her hair as she cries and wets them. She, she is rubbing her perfume on his feet. Like oftentimes when we're, we're preaching through something or whatever, we'll take a, a, an experience and we'll talk about how that culturally made sense. Like this didn't make sense there either. Like they, they, they were as, as upset and disrupted by this as any one of us would be. Simon, in contrast to this woman, hasn't honored Jesus at all. In fact, he's ignored the cultural sort of expectations of serving as a guest or or host in in that society. And so he hasn't um, allowed Jesus to clean his feet, offered him water so that he could wipe the dust off his feet. He hasn't respected him by greeting him with, with a kiss, which again was just a normal thing in that culture. He hasn't provided his blessing by anointing his head with oil. He's done none of that. Instead, it says that Simon in verse 39, the end of verse 39, he's questioning Jesus in all of this. He says, if if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. I just I want to process for a moment the, the disparity of these two responses. Because I think that this is, this is a, a, a sort of head and heart response at one level. Simon seems to be um, approaching Jesus intellectually and, and detached. So, so Jesus is going to be kept at a safe distance. He might be wondering, I wonder what it is that Jesus has to offer me. Or I wonder what it is that I can gain on him. That's his approach and understanding of Jesus. The woman, on the other hand, she approaches Jesus with her whole being. She throws herself at his feet, and there's this outburst of emotion. So this is the difference between intellectual curiosity or even intellectual assent and the overwhelming experience of being transformed by grace. And of course, there's nothing wrong at all with with becoming Um, gaining understanding on who Jesus is, growing in your depth and awareness of who he is. But if that does not lead us to an experience of his grace, then we are always keeping Jesus at a safe distance. And we ultimately miss out on what it truly means to be with him. I think it's a contrast of of control and surrender. This woman is placing her life in his hands. Her past, her her future, it's all in the hands of Jesus. That alabaster jar that's referred to here. This is is typically understood to be a a tool of her trade. Like not to get 
too into this, but in a, in a culture and society that, that had little access to, to hygiene and to regularly showering and that sort of thing, this was, this was a part of her allure. It was intended to draw her clients in. And she places it at the feet of Jesus. This, like, like Zacchaeus, this is this credible picture of repentance here. Laying it down, a changing in the direction of her life. It's an indication of her commitment and her love, her understanding of who Jesus is. He is everything. And she requires nothing else. And here's the deal. Like we, we all carry an alabaster jar. We, we all have it. Simon's is, is full of his own sense of self-righteousness. His religiosity, his power that he perceives himself to have. We all, we all carry a, an alabaster jar that represents our significance and our identity and our purpose in some way. And we all lay it down at the feet of something. We all pour it out at the feet of someone or something, that place of our hope. And this woman has chosen to pour hers out at the feet of Jesus. I think this, this contrast of response is a contrast of priority. For Simon, Jesus is just another person at the table. To this woman, he is the preeminent one. Jesus isn't one more thing, he's everything. And now it's in the midst of this stark contrast of their responses here that Jesus decides to share this parable. And, and notice the irony here that, that Simon is questioning Jesus, um, his, his credentials as a prophet, because he says, if you were a prophet, you would know who is, who is, tell, uh, who is touching you. And he's thinking this in his head, and Jesus now responds to Simon's thoughts, which might be an indication that uh, Jesus is who he says he is. Look at verse 41 through 43 again. This is actually, I'm going to back it up to verse 40. This is what Jesus replies to Simon. He said, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave both debts. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Jesus does something so brilliant here. He, he levels the playing ground because in this parable, what we need to understand is that both of these people are really on level ground. They both owed a debt that they could not pay. You see, in, in the meaning of the parable, the amount is, is insignificant, at least as it relates to their legal standing. Legally, these, both of these people are in the exact same situation, and as a result, they face the exact same consequences. They would have been put in debtor's prison or lived as indentured servants until their debt could be paid. They're in the same boat. See, this is what Jesus wants Simon to grasp here about the difference between his response and his approach to Jesus and this woman's is that she understands her awareness of her needs, of her spiritual condition is what brought her to Jesus. And this is an awareness that Simon has not, has not gained. It's escaped him. Simon is, is clearly offended by her sin, by, by her sexual sin, and yet he remains rather comfortable in his own spiritual pride and self-righteousness. See, Jesus is, is laying this all out on the table. And as a result of this awareness that she has and that he doesn't, they both respond to Jesus very differently. And all of this leaves um, with a contrast in capacity. A contrast of capacity. Um, these contrasting responses, and, and Jesus makes this point, ultimately reveal their capacity of Simon and this woman to, to love. Um, there was a, a video a few years ago that, that was used kind of, I don't know, went viral or whatever else. But it was called, It's Not About the Nail. Did you ever see this, like, where there's a husband and wife couple, and she's, like, got this nail sticking out of her forehead, and they're having, like, this 
conversation about frustration and experiences in their marriage and all that sort of thing. And she's just saying, like, I just need you to listen to me. Like, I, I have this constant headache and, and there's all my sweaters are snagged. And, and she's like, I just don't know what's going on. And he's like, well, it, it might be the nail. And she's like, it's not about the nail. Like, it's not about the nail and it's this humorous kind of sort of illustration of what we can do in marriage sometimes but but ultimately it's highlighting a larger point which is our own sometimes our own blindness to our greatest need our our own blindness to the thing that that is out there for us our, our our own healing our own salvation and yet our capacity to look right past it Look once again at, at what Jesus does here in this explanation of the, of the parable. He's pointing out to Simon, to us, that our awareness of our need and God's provision for that need directly impacts our capacity to love. This is verse 44 through 48. He says, he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Which that, that alone is significant here. Jesus is giving Um, attention, the recognition, and the awareness of her humanness and her value and worth at the table and exposing Simon to that. He says, I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven loves little. Forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. So here's the point that that Simon, that Jesus is making to Simon regarding the impact of of what it means to be with Jesus. Because in the absence of an awareness of our need and Christ's ultimate provision for that need, we will struggle to both love God, to to be able to come to him in worship, to be able to respond to who he is, to be able to surrender everything we have to him, and to fully grasp what it means to be forgiven, and we will struggle to love people. In in an absence of our awareness, we will become judgmental and self-righteous. We will will become spiritually proud people. And then our capacity or even our willingness to respond in love to others is either reduced or eliminated. Because when we fail to understand one of two things or or both of these things, and our capacity to love God and to love others is is affected we either fail to understand the depths of the debt that we owed and and we're sort of like that woman and and we have this nail in our head and we're saying it's not about the nail or we forget or we fail to understand the price that was paid to pay that debt what it costs to cover it and essentially we lose sight of the core of the gospel message our capacity to love god to love others is impacted See, ultimately, what is on display here is a contrast between what it means to be religious and what it means to be transformed by grace. The heart of the gospel is an invitation to come to Jesus with nothing to offer, with no credential, no good works, no no act of self-righteousness, and to give him complete control, complete surrender to pay a price for a debt that we could not pay a debt that we owed, that he's paid for us. See, in this passage, there are two encounters um, with the presence of Jesus. One is frustrated by Jesus and the parable that he tells. The other one is transformed and falls down at his feet to worship him. And here's the thing, we, we all leave the presence of Jesus as one of these two people in our heart. Um, either we're going to try to keep him at a safe distance, say, okay, I'll think about this more, or we're going to fall down at his feet and worship him. I'm going to ask the worship team to, to come up at this time, and we're going to do something slightly different this morning. Um, oftentimes, you'll, when I'm concluding, I'll talk about how we, it's appropriate to respond. And most of the time when we do that, we'll respond and worship together, and, and, and we do want to do that. 
But this morning, I want to make available to you, um, as we look at this passage and we look at this example of this woman who is modeling for us what it means to correctly and appropriately respond to Jesus, I, I, I want to make other avenues of response possible. I'm going to invite my prayer team, Tracy and Bill, and, and I think there's some more of you here. They're going to be over here in this right section as the worship team plays, over here to my right. Um, if you would like to just pray with somebody, they are going to be up here available to pray with you. If you would like to come up and take communion, we've, we've set up communion over here. Um, it's just going to be sort of self-serve. You can come up. There's actually pieces of bread. Um, there's the cup. You can, you can take that. This is the body of Christ that's given for you. This is his blood shed for you. If you want to stay in your seat and, and pray or just worship with the band, you can do that. But all of this is going to be taking place simultaneously. And however the Holy Spirit is leading in you, whatever your heart, however your heart wants to respond and worship this morning, over these last several minutes, I'm going to invite you, um, invite us to fall at his feet, to worship him, um, to be transformed by his grace. Let's pray and we'll, we'll participate in this time of response together. Father, we thank you for this, um, for an example of somebody so powerfully understanding and getting what it means to be impacted by your grace. Lord, we thank you for this just absolutely appropriate response of just falling at your feet and, and giving everything over to you. Lord, I pray that you would lead our hearts to that same place when we understand what it means to be with Jesus, that we would lay it all down at your feet and worship you for paying the price that we could not pay. Lord, now we want to take time just to respond to what we've heard this morning. Meet us in this place, and it's in your name we pray.